Okay, we're live streaming. We have a live stream today about the GMAGNX storm that's happening right now. And I'm gonna wait for a couple people to jump in before we get into it, make sure everything's working. I have to pull up my screens too so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, hi everyone. We are in the middle of a monster GMAGNX storm right now. And what's happening is the KP index has gone above eight. This is a measure of geomagnetic volatility. So we have an extreme amount of magnetic field fluctuations happening on the planet at this moment, which means an extreme amount of energy volatility across the entire planet simultaneously. Now there are areas where this occurs to a greater degree, and there's areas where the magnetic field isn't as volatile, like near the equator. But in general, for a geomagnetic storm, this is a global event. And it is the sun, which kicked this off. Just recently, we have these two, uh, some flares right here. They flared at the same time. This right there, that was a 1.12 X-class flare that occurred just about 48 hours ago, a little, a little less than that. And it was a very broad duration flare. We also had geomagnetic storms before this. We had an extreme solar proton radiation event. We have had more flaring occur since then, all M-class flares. Uh, there's also been a coronal hole high-speed stream. And we have a full moon lunar eclipse coming up in just seven hours. So I know I just did a live stream like less than 24 hours ago, just about 24 hours ago, just like last night, I was about to go to sleep and then I saw what was happening. I had to jump on live because I know that's kind of my duty for all of you. This is what I do. So here I am reporting on this monster geomagnetic storm. So let's look at some of this data. I see you all in the chat. Hello, welcome. Much love everyone. This is a monster. Look at this. This is really, really nuts. I know yesterday we were looking at this part of the data here. Now we can see what's been happening the past few days. Let's get the cursor on top of that top value. That's 8.667 for our HB60 index. This is a one hour measure of geomagnetic volatility. You take these magnetic field measurements across the surface of the globe at the surface. Um, and basically they, they put it into a, a one to nine rating scale. So this is quite unexpected. I mean, this geomagnetic activity here is quite strong. We are in the Russell McFerrin effect, which means there is a greater energy coupling between the sun and interplanetary space and the earth at this moment in time due to the equinoxes and the tilt of the earth relative to the sun and more but 8.667 and this uh, chronal mass ejection from the sun may not have arrived yet. The model showed it arriving at around 5 a.m. UTC time on the 25th. And right now it is about 10 p.m. UTC time for the 25th. So either it arrived faster than expected, which does seem to be the case, or this could be the high speed stream that is interacting with us, and then we still have more to come. So there is some uncertainty with this. Um, so yeah, I mean, happy Sunday, everyone. Sunday, it is the day of the sun. Absolutely, that is the case right now. Really, really crazy. We'll come back to this data here, but uh, let's actually go to our uh, HP, our, eight, our KP index, which is a three hour measure of activity. So now they average three hours and not just one hour. And you can see here 8.33 is our KP, our, our, our KP, you know, three hour index high. So even then for three hours, there was an elevated activity above eight on this scale. And this is very rare. Now, interesting to note is the last time we had a geomagnetic storm like this. Uh, I mean, we've had a few, but we had some really strong ones in April last year. But we also had geomagnetic storm just like this almost exactly a year ago, right when Pluto first moved into Aquarius, Western tropical astrology, and uh, people weren't expecting it to be a big storm at all. And then all of a sudden the KP index went like right to seven and eight and this went absolutely nuts. So I call that a Plutonian geomagnetic storm. And right now we have similar dynamics. It's not necessarily Plutonian, but we have this uh, full moon lunar eclipse that's occurring uh, in the signs of 
uh, Aries and Libra, but that's getting outside of the space weather and getting into the planetary geometry. But it's you know interesting how things uh, repeat in cycles across time. So really, really powerful storm. Let's look at the solar wind data uh, so we can really examine this in detail. And we will go into a few different graphics here. If I can get rid of this. Okay, here we go. Uh, and so what we got is, and I can maybe make this a little bigger for you all. There we go. Okay. So we have a few measurements here. We have our interplanetary magnetic field strength in black, the total field strength measured in nanotesla. We see that here going up to 40. Average value typically is about five. So here, where am I pointing? There, we're getting close to 40, okay? Red line here is our southward component. This is the part of the magnetic field that connects very nicely to Earth's magnetic field because it has a northward component. So when the two line up like this, boom, it's, it's, it's heaven, it's magic, okay? Energy can flow in. When that goes sharply negative, you get this strong injection of energy into Earth's magnetosphere, and that is like a bubble surrounding Earth's plasmasphere. So it's the plasmasphere where a lot of this energy is, and when that plasma reorganizes and moves around, it has very powerful electric currents that are created. Of course, the movement of electric current drives magnetic field changes. Every electric current creates a magnetic field. So when you have these ions moving, these charged particles moving through space-time, they create these magnetic fields that can either add or subtract to Earth's magnetic field, creating this geomagnetic volatility. And these charged particles follow the magnetic field, those force vectors. So it's this constant uh, back and forth game with uh, the electric force and the magnetic force until things eventually settle down. And that energy eventually flows down into our Earth, down into our ionosphere, into the Schumann resonances, our atmosphere, into local weather storms, to lure currents deeper into the planet, perhaps. I mean, that seems the most likely. Uh, we'd kind of be foolish to think otherwise. So we have our uh, total interplanetary magnetic field strength going really high here. It was just seven uh, this afternoon, UTC time, and now it is hanging out at about 30. So you see the difference there, going from about seven all the way up to about 30. And now the red line is in the positive, but we see these really deep injections in the negative, negative 21 there that lines up perfectly with this uh, KP value of eight. Now it's just cooling down. That, this data block at 6.33 just came in. Um, we can also notice a few things. We see that here, 563 kilometers per second for our velocity. Then it jumped up right at that increase in strength up to about 763. And then it's all the way up in the 800s now, 838 kilometers per second. That's pretty close to the top speed that you get for solar wind. So that could be the high speed stream from that coronal hole. Last time that coronal hole swept by about a month ago, it wasn't that strong. Of course, we were less geo-effective then. Uh, we weren't near as close to the equinox as we are right now. I mean, we just had the equinox. So it could be that high-speed stream. It could be the uh, coronal mass ejection from that 1.12 X-class flare from about 36 hours ago. Um, so let's look at that model just so you can get a sense of it if you haven't seen this yet. This is a really big geomagnetic storm. So after we go through this data, I'm gonna explain what could happen next um, because there's a lot of possibilities. There's also the standard possibility and just in general what happens after a geomagnetic storm. Uh, but we'll go through some of the different things and have a short Q&A. Uh, I wasn't planning on this being a long video, but who knows, we'll see. You know, I'm feeling good. So here is our uh, NOAA model showing, feeling good, that's right. Here's our NOAA model showing this impact from that uh, 1.12x class flare. Sorry, I'm standing in front of it. It's right there, big plasma wave you can see. And you can see that the, uh, whoop, 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 the velocity goes up and the density goes up. So here we go again, right here. It gets launched and then it sweeps by the earth and you get these really sharp increases both in density and in velocity combined you get a really big spike in geomagnetic activity and volatility overall now this is a model based on various data points and observations that they get but it is you know a good indicator and that that chronal mass that x class flare was exactly earth center and the chronal mass ejection as we saw in the chronograph is very clear it just 
like this on all sides, which means that it's coming towards you. So um, thank you, thank you, Carrie, for the donation, for the updates. Uh, God bless you. So we are probably in the middle of this regime right now. We could be at this point right here. Maybe it's, this is, we're a little early. Uh, this model is a little late, you could say, but we don't know, we don't know. So uh, that is the, the NOAA model. And if we go to uh, our actual magnetic field data, here is some data we can look at. This is Uppsala, Sweden. Before I was saying Uppsala, it's Uppsala. And here we see our total magnetic field strength. So we're measuring the KP index. What we're doing is we're looking at the total magnetic field across a variety of stations. And you can use intermagnet, and you can look at these as global magnetic observatories. That's why when people say the magnetic field has dropped 40% in strength, that's simply not true because we have these measurements and it has not dropped 40%. That's a very sizable drop. But there are swings based on these geomagnetic storms. So and there are diurnal variations. There's normal ebbs and flows and ups and downs in the magnetic field. They're greater near the uh, polar cusp, so northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, and they're a little weaker and more flat uh, mid latitudes near the and then also the equator. So a diurnal variation can be 10, 20, 50 nanotesla, maybe a couple hundred near the poles. But during geomagnetic storm, it can be really big. So here, for example, right there, uh, that's measuring about 51,800 nanotesla at Uppsala. And then if we look here at the top of this point there, that is. 52,000, nearly 52,600 nanotesla. So nearly a 800 nanotesla swing, about a 750 nanotesla swing at the peak. Now it's starting to come down. Because that scale had to adjust over here, all the diurnal variations got kind of flattened, okay? So normally there's nice diurnal variations. I could actually uh, reduce this to three days to show you what they look like and they'll pop out. We do see a geomagnetic storm here, so that's like a smaller geomagnetic storm. And then we go to five days to get the most recent data for Uppsala, which is near that north magnetic pole, and we see how this puts the other storm in scale. So this is one way of looking at geomagnetic storms going right to the source, intermagnet. Um, and yeah, you may be feeling this. I mean, these geomagnetic storms are very powerful. There's been uh, quite a bit of research showing them linked to increased uh, cardiac infarctions, so like heart attacks or just arrhythmias. Uh, also, there's some evidence, uh, anecdotal and otherwise, of like increases in seizures um, and just overall body spasms. Basically, you have more energy flux in the environment, and of course, we're bioelectrical beings. We're, we're, we're electrical to our core. And so when our uh, electrical systems get overloaded, especially for very sensitive people, like people that can have seizures are very, very, very sensitive to this, uh, that can be just too much for them. Uh, or you have a weak heart, or your heart field isn't strong, right, then that can be too much. So we do have evidence that these uh, geomagnetic storms can be uh, you know, very difficult for some people health-wise. And then there's a lot of evidence out there anecdotally because uh, they haven't studied this, that this is also a really powerful time for people that are strong in their heart energy and their health and wellness. It's a very creative, uh, powerful time for uh, yourself energetically. I know that, like for example, I've caught myself uh, going to the gym, doing a workout, and I didn't know there was a storm. Like it started when I was at the gym, and I'm feeling really good. I'm like lifting heavy. I'm like, I'm like strong today. Well, there's something there to that. So. Um, so yeah, this can affect our health and wellness. Of course, our brain, our cognition, our brain waves overlap with Schumann resonances. These things all eventually kind of filter down into the Schumann resonances. And so let's look at some other stations here. We can go to uh, the Southern Hemisphere Scott Base. Uh, so let me just pull up Scott Base right here, Antarctica. And this is the near, right near the uh, Southern uh, South Pole field cusp. And so we see some pretty big swings here uh, 62,600 62, up to 63,000 there. So, you know, these are hundreds of nanotesla where typically you don't get that. If we go to uh, Vesuris, Brazil, 
that is in uh, that South Atlantic anomaly, and you'll see the variations there are quite a bit weaker. So we'll go to Viserys, Brazil, and you can see that even during this geomagnetic storm, yes, there are some differences here, as you can see, compared to the normal diurnal variations, but the actual scale bar right here uh, is going from 23,150 to 23,300. So it's a 150 uh, overall scale, which is a uh, not, you know, 1,000, 2,000 like Uppsala is. So uh, we can also look at just a few other areas before we move on to some other uh, data sets. We'll look at Boulder, Colorado uh, in the United States. So I can find Boulder. Uh, so everyone in the U.S., hello, hello. Go America, go USA, you know. So here, uh, here is our Boulder, Colorado variations. We have our diurnal in the northern hemisphere, these diurnal dips go down and then they go back up. And so here we can see this geomagnetic storm, a very severe dip going down there as compared to our normal diurnal variations like we see there. So uh, even at these mid latitudes, it can be quite significant. This is uh, the bottom here is 51,150 nanotesla. The top is 51,350. So that's the 200 nanotesla top to bottom. So that is about a about a 175 nanotesla, very sharp, rapid drop. Um, so quite significant. And just a metaphor to give you all is, uh, and I've been playing with this idea, this metaphor for the past few days, is that the magnetic field is this big, the Earth is basically big, a big direct, cur uh, direct current circuit, it's an electrical circuit. So it's going like this, it's direct current. It's not alternating. Alternating current goes here, 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 t -t 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 -t, right? It's pulsing. There is a alternating current component, but Earth is a direct, current, uh, direct current and it creates this magnetic field as a result. Uh, and then on top of this very large direct current, this very large field of potential or magnetic field, 50,000 nanotesla, let's say, there are these small uh, variations that are five nanotesla, 50 nanotesla, 100 nanotesla for a geomagnetic storm. So you have this very vast kind of store of force energy, and then you have these smaller variations on top. And so this effectively is digging deeper into that store of energy. And I like to think of this as like the conscious mind or the small variations up top. And then you have the unconscious mind, which is the larger circuit. And the most power is in the unconscious mind, like how much uh, cognition and power and just information is in the unconscious or the subconscious. It's really quite tremendous. So when you get these spikes that go down, that is plumbing the depths greater uh, than you would otherwise uh, be able to go, let's say. You'd be able to access and tap into different states that normally it's more difficult to do. I was actually just watching a whole bunch of videos on like colossal squids, which <laughs> God, those things are crazy. We don't even know what lives in the oceans. It's the same thing with our mind. Like what even is in our unconscious that, or subconscious that we don't even know of yet? What monsters lurk in the depths? And so this lunar eclipse right now is many way, in many ways bringing that to the forefront. Like it's, it's bringing, it's shining lights into these dark areas and you know causing these really big energy swings so we can examine these things with uh, for the first time and then also with a fresh perspective perhaps for some of us, uh, you know, are deep sea divers. So uh, yeah, just something on the more spiritual side for you all, but uh, really powerful stuff happening right now just on our planet, just from an energetic standpoint. We can also look at our DST index. Here we can see that it's dropping quite rapidly. Let me refresh this. I don't know how often this refreshes, uh, but we can see that we've dropped below 100 nanotesla, uh, which is this line right about here. So we're starting to go below 100 nanotesla now. Um, and if we look at our proton flux, you know, we are in this um, proton storm right now. So we can go here really quick, full screen this bad boy. There is our proton flux from that 1.12 X-class flare. A uh, huge, huge, huge storm. So not only are we getting these very strong solar wind energies, and we've had these prior geomagnetic storms and a coronal hole high-speed stream, but we also have extreme charging of the uh, north and south pole ionosphere due to these protons because they stream in at the poles. 
and that is charging the overall plant as well, really charging that global electric circuit. Uh, and those uh, currents in the ionosphere can also add and subtract to Earth's magnetic field a little closer to home. And the ring current that circles around the Earth is also being uh, altered and changed right now. This interacts with the ring current. So, I mean, there's just too much information to, to give it all to you. So I'm hoping that you can kind of feel in between it all to understand the fact that there's just a monster energy flux storm happening right now and uh, how that's going to manifest over the next uh, few hours and few days, we'll find out. I think often these types of energy, extreme energy events, um, we really f see the effects of that in the following days and weeks because as we talked about the health effects, uh, there's also the mental effects. People think different, they behave different, they act different, and that then ripples out because once you have an action, there's consequences to that, whether good or bad. Um, the phrase that I have is once you carve it, you create it. So once you've done something, it, you, there's no going back in time. So we'll see how some of these actions propagate and ripple out from this extreme monster geomagnetic storm and this lunar eclipse that we have. And we have the big total solar eclipse coming up on the 8th, which is uh, the sun conjunct Chiron on the north node. Uh, so Chiron being like this healing aspect. So we'll see maybe there's going to be some cleanup with the total solar eclipse from this eclipse that we have right now. Big proton storm right now. Let's look at our aurora. Uh, and actually I last loaded this uh, a while ago. So let me refresh this. I hope this loads pretty quick for you all. Uh, looks like it is. Uh, ba -ba -da -da. I see you all in the chat. Thank you all for being here. We'll do Q&A in just a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm happy to have you all here, part of the channel, part of the live stream. Hope you're all enjoying your Sunday. Uh, hope it's been a great day. Beautiful sunset here in uh, Cologne in Germany. Um, and that was right when the geomagnetic storm was starting. Then I uh, just you know had dinner and eventually checked the data. I was like, whoa, and there we see our uh, aurora and our storm start up. So if we go back here, we'll see the big uh, push with that increase in interplanetary magnetic field strength. There's the big burst of aurora. Looks like mostly Russia got that. Parts of Central and Western Europe too. Now it's rotating through down here. We'll see if any of this energy increases or lingers for North America. Um, but the big aurora push was for the Siberia region and parts of Northern Europe. We can also look at the South Pole for the Aurora Australis. Uh, of course, how many people live down here? Not too many, but just to get an overall sense of the, uh, the, the globe as a whole, we can look at this. And so here we see our Aurora Australis and we'll see a similar push come up, um, but maybe not as significant. I actually haven't watched this one yet, so we'll see what it does should be coming up right about here. Looks like there was a little increase right there. Um, there we go, there is our big push of energy uh, really hitting, of course, Antarctica. It's not reaching Australia. According to this model, this is a forecast, so if you have a time-lapse of photography capabilities, you may want to get out there if it is uh, nighttime for you. But it looks like that happened during the, uh, yeah, that was nighttime for Australia. So. You may want to go out there, perhaps catch some lights if you're in that area. Um, down under, it is fall for you guys down there. So it's not spring equinox, it's fall equinox for you all. And I uh, just want to make sure, let's also look at this really quick. We have our GOES magnetometers. This is something people often don't talk about. Let's just quickly go over it so you can understand what this is measuring. This is really an intermediate between the interplanetary magnetic field and Earth's magnetic field. Basically, magnetic fields die off with the inverse square law. So as you move further away, they drop off really rapidly. Um, and so Earth's magnetic field at the surface is anywhere from about 20,000 to uh, about 65,000 nanotesla. Uh, but as you go away from the surface, it diminishes pretty quickly. So once you're at 5.6 Earth radii, like we have here with the GO satellites, um, you are now in a area of much weaker magnetic field strength. So here the magnetic field typically 
you can see is about 100 nanotesla and there are of course diurnal cycles so you see these normal cycles and rhythms uh, and this is of course based on the rotation of the earth uh, and also the location of these satellites as they zip around and you know they're getting sometimes closer to the surface further away here's our storm you can see how the magnetic field first went through these big oscillation the the go 16 satellite is the one in red massive massive oscillation is a big heartbeat pulse boom are you awake hello moment right there and you can see that the overall strengthen in general since then so what this is really measuring is kind of where the interplanetary magnetic field connects to earth's magnetic field and the stronger the interplanetary magnetic field that's created by the sun the deeper it can connect into earth's magnetic field because 40 nanotesla let's say which is about where it's at. It's about 30 nanotesla right now. 30 nanotesla on the interplanetary magnetic field connects with 30 nanotesla in Earth's magnetic field. So the stronger the interplanetary magnetic field is, the deeper you can get into it because you'll reach 30 nanotesla further in. Whereas eventually Earth's magnetic field will hit five and if it's normally five, they connect further out. So the stronger the interplanetary magnetic field, the, the closer into the Earth it can get. And so then you allow these deeper energy injections. The energy in the plasma is not being injected into the outer plasma sphere but into the inner plasma sphere. And so this whole process can be accelerated. Normally these plasma flows take some time, they get reorganized, a lot of them get shot off down through the magneto tail. Right now we have the moon in the magneto tail reflecting some of that back which is adding chaos to this whole equation. Um, but if it's injected deeper it can go right into the radiation belts, go right into the rain current, uh, start precipitating immediately down into the ionosphere. Um, so that's some of the dynamics of how that works. It's really, if you have a 5 nanotesla field, you're not going to connect to the 40. The 40 is going to be much stronger overall. It, you have to wait till this one kind of diminishes to 40 and then there's a kind of like an equivalence of uh, connection. Now it depends on the vector orientations. So um, that, that's, that's effectively how that works, where that energy can then be transferred between the fields. And effectively, at the end of the day, it's all one big field. You know, our magnetic field connects straight to the sun. It connects straight to all the other planets, the entire solar system, beyond uh, Kuiper Belt, Oort Cloud, other stars, uh, interplanetary magnetic field, interplanetary space. I have a video on that. Um, also, a quick note is I have a video on how to prepare for a geomagnetic storm. Um, it's a little late to prepare now, but if you want to watch that video, you can just type in prepare on my channel search bar. It'll pop right up. Um, it's a green thumbnail, so you'll see that. Uh, but still good tips in there for getting ready for one, uh, for during one, for after one, and just also just for being healthier, just for being a healthier person. So um, yeah, give that a look. So let's. Uh, it's a good course. It's like an hour long, totally free. Check that out. So we can look at kind of our sun. Here we have some latest imagery from SDO. This is our magnetogram. Um, really, really, really nice. Uh, we see kind of the progression effectively that we have here. We have our two baddies right here, and then we got the next two, and then we got the next two. So uh, we'll start off with some big, you know, grand slams, and then perhaps things will cool down a little bit, and then I mean, we'll see if they grow though. I mean, these sunspots here could grow more. Uh, for example, this one right here grew very rapidly when it was around this position and started rotating through. So we'll see. Uh, but as of right now, we got a whole lineup here. This is really just the beginning. And also when these reach these zones here, there's a very strong coupling between the sun and the earth. We already saw that this um, sympathetic joint 1.12 X-class flare created an extremely powerful proton radiation storm and that's at a lesser degree of coupling. So these go here and do something similar. By God, we're going to see uh, some really crazy proton radiation storms perhaps. So that is an example of what can happen next. And the thing is with, for example, these geomagnetic storms, let's say the power grids. Everyone's talking about the power grid. Is the power grid going to go down? I think one aspect of that is how long is the power grid going to be stressed for? Is it going to be stressed for five hours or is it going to be stressed for five days? 
So if we have an extended period of geomagnetic volatility for five days, six days, I mean 10 days, it's possible. It's not impossible. Then that's when I think we can start really thinking about power failures because you have one transformer, another one blows out, but once they start stacking up perhaps, that could be, uh, that could not be good. So KP value over eight for this geomagnetic storm off of a 1.12 X class flare. Long duration, but still, this was not an X10, X20. Um, so we can also look at our intensity gram, which is another way of looking at these sunspots, just kind of their characteristics. Here we have our intensity gram. And we see just the size of this beast right here. All the cores intermixed. Uh, a little bit of actual looks like over the past day where they've been uh, kind of like now coalescing into larger cores. But we still have a whole bunch of cores there. Let's zoom in. Uh, da -da. Just get this lined up for you. There we go. Uh, so yeah, we see some big cores here now. Uh, but we still have quite a lot of smaller cores. This is like almost 200,000 kilometers uh, across, which is bigger than Jupiter. So you can imagine uh, Jupiter, right, sitting basically like that right there. So this is, this is a big mama, okay? Really, really, really big. And then we also have this one there, this one there, this one. Actually, a really nice square shape. Just interesting. Um, these are almost identical now. So this one has grown recently too. Uh, and looks like this one's actually grown a little bit too over the past uh, 24 hours since the last live stream. So those are uh, our main data sets that we're gonna look at. I don't think there's anything else. I, I will pull up, uh, well, let's look one more time at a KP index to see what's happened. We have our HP 30 index here which will allow us to um, look at the fine high resolution temporal changes. And so we can see that things are starting to cool down now. We've had some, H or some HP 30 values of five and four, so that's good. We the bulk of this geomagnetic storm, um, at least this phase, is over. So we'll see if that next, if that CME impact comes in. This could be the high speed stream this could be the, uh, the, the actual chronal mass ejection. It's hard to say. Uh, High-speed streams can trigger really powerful geomagnetic storms. So this could be the high-speed stream and we still have that CME coming in in just a few hours. That's, that is possible. Um, so let us go to Intermagnet and I can look up locations just if anyone wants, but now we'll do a Q&A. Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, happy to see you all here in the chat. Looks like it's been pretty active. I hope it's been a fun, enjoyable one. I hope you've had a good Sunday in general um, and that you're feeling good and well with this, that you've, you've you know, learned to, to channel these energies in a good way. And if not, that this experience that you're going through is helping you to learn to channel these energies in a very positive, beneficial way. Um, does this cause pain? It can. I mean, there's too many people that have commented during these sort of storms on my channel and across just the internet in general that they feel pain uh, at times. And uh, pain is, you know, a signal that your brain creates and it can be created from a whole bunch of different factors. And sometimes it's just inflammation based and things like energy flux can increase free radicals in the body. Uh, these are just basically loose charges that are roaming around and kind of attaching to things, binding to them, reacting with them. Uh, it's all electromagnetic at the end of the day and that can, you know, this energy flux that's increased can create and trigger more inflammation and uh, the body could, you know, kind of interpret that as pain. Um, pain is a signal though. It's a signal that you should pay attention to and learn from. So keep that in mind. Um, what is Planet X? Planet X is effectively, there's some gravitational anomalies that exist in our solar system, especially in the outer planets. They can't fully explain their orbits with what we know about the solar system. So they speculate that there is some unknown object or objects, something that has some gravitational mass 
that is interacting with these planets. And it's, it's like Earth size or, or smaller. I think it's like uh, smaller than Earth. Or it's a very large uh, mass, but it's very, very far away. So perhaps it's a binary star system interacting with these things. Like Bernard's star, I learned this theory recently. It's very interesting that the, the second closest star to Earth uh, is a brown dwarf. It's actually the fastest moving star heading right towards us. This could be a binary star system. Um, we don't know. But Planet X is this hypothetical gravitational gravity object, mass object that's interacting and moving things around. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of theories and, you know, I don't want to say the word conspiracy theory because that's the word has a lot of energy into it. But right, a lot of different ideas as to what Planet X is and what it's going to do, whether it's real or not. Um, feeling very upbeat, happy, energetic. All right, let's keep the good vibes rolling. Hello from Antarctica. David, are you serious? Are you in Antarctica? <laughs> That'd be really cool if you are. Please, please respond. Um, is it going to affect us? Uh, I'm not sure what you're, what, what, Planet X or something else? Should we start to worry? Uh, well, I don't think we should really worry about things as long as we're informed and knowledgeable about them. If, uh, if, if, you know, if, if we're aware of the issue, um, it's like the serenity prayer. Like you, you can either you you can learn to accept things that you can't change, or have the wherewithal to change the things that you can, and the wisdom to know the difference, right? So if you if you kind of follow that procedure, then you're all good. There's really no need to worry. Um, now, if your your heart is jumping out of your chest, then you know do what you need to do to to make that to to solve that problem, right? But worrying is still only going to make that worse. Uh, so. Um, ba -ba. Mm -hmm. The Great Central Sun. What about the eclipse, March 25th and April 8th? Yes, I talked about that a lot in my live stream. We have the uh, lunar eclipse uh, just in about seven hours or so. Uh, sun at five degrees of Aries, moon at five degrees of Libra, Western tropical astrology for the archetypal energies. And uh, yeah, there's a lot baked into that eclipse. Sun is exalted in Aries. Uh, we saw that the solar flare started right as the sun ingressed into Aries. Um, so it works. Uh, big eclipse, all this energy is modifying that. I mean, a lot of people are looking at the April 8th solar eclipse, uh, the total solar eclipse. Uh, not as many people have been focusing on the March 25th lunar eclipse, but I would say all this space weather is making this a much more significant event than it would have been otherwise. That's why you should look at both and incorporate them together and then, you know, that's your final deliverable, you could say. Will this affect my heart implant? No, you should be fine. Just, you know, be aware of your energy and how you feel. Uh, there have been some reports, but they're very few and far between. Uh, but, you know, just, just be aware, be conscious, don't be sleepy. Um, super zont. Well, that might just be your, your body giving you a sign that you need a rest and nap. Uh, so if you're tired, you know, if you need to rest, rest. Um, and then when you need to go, go. That's that's how I operate, at least. Um, we're in the beginning of Maxima. Yes, it's Solar Cycle 25 Maximum. Uh, we basically have kind of hit into that groove uh, just over the past, um, I would say, about six months or so. We can actually go to our uh, Solar Cycle Progression chart right here and we can look at our solar cycle progression and we'll see solar maximum uh, has effectively started we can zoom out just a little bit here's solar cycle 24 you can see that we're above the values for 24 with solar cycle 25 there's 24 there's 25 so yeah we're kind of at the beginning of this maximum we got more of this to go 24 months um, 36 months, you know, 24 months is a long maximum, but we have this maximum and the, the first part of the declining phase. So we have like two to three years where we're gonna have a lot of solar activity. And it's also possible to have big solar activity in some of these like mid to low areas too. That's when some of the biggest flares have actually been uh, shot off. So something to keep in mind. Um, Robert, I don't know who Robert Sepper is, uh, apologies. Uh, Pons Brooks comment will affect Earth. Uh, well, it maybe energetically. Uh, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's going to impact the Earth, but the fact that there's a comment happening at this time 
uh, and also it's going to be passing by right around that eclipse the total solar eclipse is very interesting so um, yeah I mean comets are herald of changes uh, in history uh, you just have to do a little research there to see that it's really interesting well, hi from Western New York hello hello black swan incoming well, that's the thing with black swan events is that you just don't know they're going to happen. I mean, is it going to be a banking crisis? Is it going to be some sort of like an asteroid impact or, you know, power grid failure? Or, I mean, we, we don't know. So there's a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of things that could be a black swan. And when it happens, it happens. But we don't know if it's incoming. But definitely there's more energy and charge available right now for these sort of things. Um, Worry is betting against yourself. Worry is betting against yourself, Tara Terrence McKenna. Um, I want off this carnival ride. Well, just go within, and then you'll you know that that'll get you off the carnival ride. They want you on the carnival, but if you go in, you're out of it. Uh, you're welcome, Jane. Um, feeling it big time. Head pain and body vibrating. Yeah. Um, with the head pain, uh, you know, those things like curcumin, which help, drink lots of water. Uh, you know, even, I wouldn't recommend it right now, but you can even have a coffee. Um, that could, uh, you know, just the adenosine receptors just a little bit, or green tea could be good with uh, the L-theanine. That, that's what I could recommend for the headache. Uh, CBD, if you have any CBD, just rub it right on your forehead. That works great for headaches. Also for the body pain, joint pain in general, CBD is primo, primo. Um, also like rosemary, lavender essential oil. Um, uh, if you have blue chamomile essential oil, chamomile tea, blue lotus essential oil, essential oil. There's a whole bunch of different essential oils and products that you can use for pain. Uh, very natural without you know having any liver issues like NSAIDs or whatever. So keep that in mind. Um, Coffee sounds good. I mean, it's not what I would rec re recommend right now for a geomagnetic storm, but you could do just a little bit if you have a really bad headache, you haven't had some recently, that would help just kind of the dump the adenosine receptors and could help out. But hey, you know, if you want to surf the big maverick wave, go for it, man. <laughs> you, can have, uh, you can have coffee and more. There's a lot of things you could stack on top. Um, dosage of the CBD to help bone pain. Well, you want to do a tincture, you could do sublingual under your tongue, or you could just do an edible. Uh, or, I mean, what what I would do is, if I had like bad bone pains, I would get a lotion, rub it on those parts, then do the sublingual t uh, tincture as well, and get the internal and the external working together, and that would really, really soothe that away. Uh, I also have this really amazing like, Tiger Balm that I bought in Bali. Uh, no, Thailand. It has like nutmeg oil, and that stuff's amazing. So you could look into getting some sort of like nutmeg uh, oil cream. That could be good. Rose quartz. I love rose quartz. Tuning in from Israel. Hello, shalom. Um, Red Bull and coffee beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> yeah, you might not come back down. Uh, sit at meditation. Yeah, I mean, of course, we could talk about the holistic wellness practices, deep breathing exercises, you know, clean, fresh air, going on a walk, uh, redirecting your mental attention. If you're very focused here all the time, you know, letting your eyes breathe, landscapes, visual scapes, uh, yoga nidra. Of course, we start with meditation. You could go into meditation, whether this is active awareness meditation or this is repeating a mantra or something like transcendental meditation where you just repeat gibberish. Uh, that's the secret, by the way, if you didn't know. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do to help calm the body down during all this. Or you can get the energy out. I mean, that's one way to do it too. If you have it, like get it out. Some people, it's better for them to just release it, get it out, do something. Uh, and then really it'll be a little easier to rest and relax afterwards. Thank you, Callie, for the donation. Two dollars, every dollar counts. Thank you, God bless. Um, cool, cool, yo. Get a cat, cats are great. Uh, get a dog, dogs are great too. I have a turtle, so you could also get a turtle. <laughs> uh, Epsom salt bath with essential oils, yes. I mean, that is, that is one of the best things. Epsom salt, all the magnesium, really good for you. It just absorbs into your body. Essential oils are very calming. You could also add some incense. Uh, 
aromatherapy has been shown to like relax the body, relax the system, your brain waves, uh, alpha rhythms, uh, get nice and calm down. Alpha rhythms are those eight to 12 hertz brain waves. They're strongest when your eyes are closed, like during meditation. So light some incense, get the lavender essential oil, uh, the Epsom salt bath, do that heat soak. Uh, the heat shock proteins will help with inflammation, get the pain reduced, it feels great, loosen up the muscles, you know, it's just this whole big reset. And uh, that is just an amazing way to just naturally reset yourself and improve your health and wellness uh, and look and feel glamorous at the same time. So there's a lot of things you can do. My turtle's name. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, Joey is, uh, I'm not sure he's still hibernating. He must be out and about now. Uh, he is just a little box turtle, just like this. So just a cute little guy. He's like 50 years old, uh, at least. He's He's... He could be, he's definitely older than me. He could be, uh, really, we don't know how old he is because he was full grown when I got him. I got him when I was like five. Um, I'm 32 now. So, I mean, he could be 50, 60, 70, 80. I think he's like 50, 55. But, you know, I, he, he will probably outlive me. Uh, but we're hoping to, you know, ride into the sunset together. So, uh, DLJ. Thank you so much for the donation, $5. Uh, it all counts. Uh, thank you so much. I'm glad that you've, you know, I'm providing value to you all, that you find this helpful, this breakdown. Um, take your salt baths. Organite. Organite's interesting. So Organite, I mean, I'm not an expert, but basically it's you know like epoxy that they just put all this stuff into, like copper filings and these weird coils and different things and they make these really beautiful structures. Um, but it's not like an actual crystal. It's, it's kind of a man-made construction. And so I'm kind of skeptical of it. But I met uh, Estes Tone, the really amazing guitar player who's um, Ukrainian and Israeli. Uh, maybe you've heard of him. He's this complete uh, like improvisation. Uh, just blew my mind when I watched him uh, perform this live uh, in Costa Rica back in November. He had this really big organite necklace and he swore by the thing. He said that some guy measured at one point and the field values on this thing went crazy. I'm still kind of skeptical about all this because I mean I don't know how as a measure or whatever. He's not you know a geophysicist so he doesn't exactly know. He's just a brilliant musician. But, I mean, the guy's a brilliant musician. This guy is at the very top of the creative craft. And he just had this huge organite necklace. So there's something to it. So I can't comment it too much on, like, my own uh, thoughts. But that's some observations and just experiences I've had. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, thank you so much. Five dollars. Was that the arm flex? Yeah, let's go. G Magnetic Storm. Uh, we're getting pumped up with the energies right now. I hope you guys are all feeling good with it. That's your first super too. Um, yeah, cool. Yes, Estes Tone. His music's incredible. If you want something to, to really just take you off to another planet, jump into outer space, uh, you could listen. He has some great, um, some great live concerts on YouTube. And then he has Spotify, all the other stuff too. But I mean, I was transported to another realm when he was playing. It was incredible. Um, I am a sage. I would, I would like to, one of my things I've said for a long time is that when I'm older, I'm going to have a huge beard and my hair is going to be really long. I'm going to go full wizard. Uh, so I mean, I have the long hair now. I'm actually getting this cut soon, uh, maybe on Tuesday. Uh, but when I am older, I'm just going to let it just go full Gandalf mode. So then I'll be a true sage. Um, with hopefully the wisdom to to back it up. Um, where am I? I'm in Germany right now. Yeah, the, the stick of incense on his guitar. You know, he puts that there, lights it, and I mean, these little things, they, they add up. When you do these little things that help you get into certain states of mind or certain states of health or emotional states or spiritual states, uh, these little details count. You don't discount the little things. They build up. That 1% better every day really grows, or 1% worse every day kind of goes the opposite direction. So these things matter. Uh, NGC, thank you so much. I, 
Joey, uh, he likes sweet potato, but he also does chomp on some greens every now and then. I will buy him some lettuce for you. Thank you so much for the donation. Uh, is that Australian? I think that's Australian. Either way, thank you so much for the energy exchange. I appreciate that. Um, light sparks in my hair. Oh, that's the, uh, that's the green screen. That's just the, the green screen bleed. Uh, don't cut my hair. I'm getting kind of tired of it though. It's, it's nice, but also don't worry. It'll be better, okay? Um, Ellen, thank you so much for the donation. I make the German girls giggle. <laughs> well, I don't know German, um, so I'm not sure how much they're giggling unless they know English, but, uh, and I'm not sure what they're giggling about. But, uh, we'll see, I'm here for like six weeks. Uh, oil painter, thank you for the donation. Um, and thank you, Susie, for the, uh, for the comment. Uh, and for being a superstar member for two months now. Uh, by the way, if you want to sign up and become a member of the channel, a special channel member, that is an option. I have different um, videos that are available to you that are not public, uh, like my Earth Magnetic Field Master Guide. Normally it's paid, you have that ad free. I also pre release videos, and I'm going to be doing that more for the next two weeks or so because I'm going, I already have like two videos right now that are in the works, they're done. They're going to be uploaded and hit live when I choose. Uh, so you can watch this ad free. And there's going to be other perks coming with time. But if you just would like to share your support in a more consistent way, you can become a special channel member. Just thought I'd mention that to you all. Donna, thank you for the 999. Really appreciate that. Thank you for being you as well and for the energy exchange. Uh, I know I'm missing questions here. I'm sorry. We're just kind of having fun now with the live stream. Uh, it does act as an antenna, so uh, I mean, there's there's no good. Okay, if you want to be like really strict, there's like no good scientific evidence on like long hair being an antenna. Like you go to Google Scholar and you type it in, you're not going to find it. Um, but again, there's a lot of studies that don't show up in Google Scholar. Uh, now, supposedly there was a study that was done during Vietnam using Native Americans, and they had uh, Native American scouts. And the ones that had long hair performed much better in their intuition and in their scouting than the ones that had their hair cut. And um, supposedly with Native American tradition, that's why men would have their hair long. It's because it gives them more ESB or extrasensory perception. Now I try to find that study uh, that is you know, kind of like in the rumor mill, couldn't find it. But based on my own experience with the long hair, I do think it makes you more receptive to these energies. You know, hair is made out of protein. Protein is a very conductive uh, material. So you're gonna be more connected to these natural energy fields and then it goes straight into your brain. Like on the human body, if you look at the human, right? Why do we grow so much hair here? Why are my pits not growing out like 10 feet? I mean, you can have these, these girls that have their hair or guys, but more so girls, women, all the way down to like their ankles and beyond if they want to but you don't have chest hair growing out like, you know, six feet. So there's something about long hair on the head that is connected to our consciousness. Now, I also will say that I think that once you've developed and really built that ESP, I think you can carry that with you uh, even if your hair is cut shorter. It may get diminished, but I think what I've learned and the experiences I've had in developing my intuition with the help of this long hair, I don't think that's just going to vanish when I when I cut my hair a little shorter. I'm not doing it super short though. I'm not buzz cutting it. So, um, so those are my thoughts on uh, long hair. I think you were talking about France, not Germany. Oh, maybe it's something else. Uh, I love to watch your videos. I wish I can better understand all you explain. I'm sensitive to EMF. That's how I found your channel. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Uh, that's what I like to talk about is not only space weather and what's happening um, in terms of like geophysics, heliophysics, things of that nature. I also like to talk about the spirituality, astrology, um, things even like divination. Uh, but then also really important is how these energies interact with us. There's like this disconnect with modern society and science of like, here's this really interesting thing and then it's completely separated and like barricaded off from how it interacts with us. Uh, and so 
here's this microwave that we can heat up food, but do we ever talk about how that influences our health? Uh, I mean, the reason the microwave works the way it does is because water has this curve. Thank you. Oh, oh my God, Susie, God bless you, $50. Wow, that is the record for this uh, live stream, one of the records of all time. That's incredibly generous of you. Thank you so much. Um, and for that energy exchange, I, I give you blessings of supreme abundance. Everyone in this chat here, I give you all blessings of supreme abundance, love, joy, success, uh, and peace and happiness. Um, back to the microwave. So there's this, there's this curve with water. The susceptibility uh, goes up dramatically starting at 1 gigahertz up to 100 gigahertz. And so a microwave uses these uh, you know, 50, 100, and uh, plus gigahertz waves to oscillate these molecules and that heats up the food. But not all that energy is converted into heat. Water has this ability to hold on to electromagnetic information. We've seen this with a variety of experiments, um, the quantum dynamic properties of water. And so these energies, a gigahertz is, um, what is that? That's uh, a billion times per second because a kilohertz is a thousand times per second, megahertz is a million times per second, Gigahertz is a billion times per second oscillation. Now, visible light is faster than that, um, of course. But these microwave energies do affect us. So, and that's what they're using now in 5G is they're using gigahertz, especially more in like the 10, 20, 30, 50. So it's starting to hit that water susceptibility curve. Well, if you heat up food in the microwave, some of that energy is now in that food you eat it and now it's vibrating in here and spreads all across your body and yeah, of course you're going to feel zapped. So uh, that's one example of EMFs affecting us. And uh, I mean, how many people talk about that? People put their face right in front of the microwave, like looking at their food and now they're, they're, your brain is just getting blasted with microwaves. That little wire mesh there does almost nothing to block them. So um, I wanted to go back. Thank you, T in Arizona, for the donation, $20. Uh, I will keep reporting on the sun. Happy to do this live stream here about this GMAX storm, what's happening. We Let's get the sun view up because we can uh, look at our sun while we're talking. And also, um, information sponge. Water is an information sponge. Exactly. Energy information sponge. Um, and then also, uh, Choosy. Thank you for the $5. Enable peace through education. I 100% believe that we need to better educate ourselves and each other, our society, our community, our, our, our nations, our governments, our planet as a whole. Uh, and I'm just one small piece of that puzzle through my channel. And then we're all part of that. Uh, and everyone else is educating their own ways. So, um, yeah, I think it's time for me to sign off. So thank you all so much for uh, being a part of this live stream. I hope you all are doing well and that you are enjoying this geomagnetic storm energy. And if you're feeling any sort of, um, you know, health effects from that, then I have my video for you, how to prepare for a geomagnetic storm. You can watch that. That will help you out a lot, giving you uh, a lot of uh, blessings of love and abundance and just overall peace and happiness. I'll see you all in the next stream. Namaste, namaskaram, and I'll see you on the next one.